Right, we're on full screen and uh, welcome everyone. Welcome here this morning and welcome to the people at home as well. And I think that at this point, although we prayed for the breaking of bread, I want to, I want to pray uh, for uh, the whole service as well. Father God, we want to commit our service today to you. We know that every time we meet, we remember the fact that you say that if we meet in the name of Jesus, you will be in our midst. And so we welcome you here in our midst. And we ask you to presence yourself through the power of the Holy Spirit in every service throughout the world where our brothers and sisters are meeting in the name of Jesus. We commit our whole country to you. We pray that you will bless our country with your presence this morning. May many people be attracted either to church or online to be able to participate. May many people come to know Jesus. And we pray those things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So welcome everyone. It's good to be together this morning. And uh, we're going to uh, be sharing with a little bit of uh, singing again this morning. And uh, I think it's time to worship. Do you agree? So we'll sing, come, now is the time to worship. And I'll get that in just a moment. It does take a moment or so to share screen. Right, here we go. Would you like to stand? Please sing along at home with us. It will start, I'm sure. Now is the time to worship. Now, now is the time to Thank 
Amen. Come just as you are to worship. That cross. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Once again, we continue with the uh, series that we've been doing, um, made available by Rick Warren, but adapted by me for Calvary and for my own style. And it's a faith that works when life doesn't. And we're in part six today, which specifically centers upon the words, a faith that stays calm in a crisis. So that's what it's all about today. A faith that stays calm in a crisis. Uh, you'll also see at the bottom of the screen, if you want to make notes of it, that uh, we have our uh, recordings available uh, on the YouTube channel, that will be my YouTube channel, and you'll see all the recordings there if you go to this particular channel, and you know the whole Bitly story, and it's YTube Steve. And uh, you've also got the, uh, the recording, uh, not the video, but the recording, the audio and the notes on our website, which is calvaryassembly.co.za or VA, depending where you live in the world. So um, those are available every week. And uh, I'm not always very quick on getting them up, and it's a few days after the service, but I'll try to do it a little quicker in future because I've now put it on the screen for you to see, and so you should be able to see it tomorrow or so. I'll do my best to do that. All right, so here we are then. What have we done so far? We have done five sessions, and today is number six. The first five is a valley that walks through the valley of vir or the faith that walks through the valley of, vi of virus. The second one is a faith that isn't troubled by troubles. The third one is a faith that makes tough choices easier and a faith that counters my bad habits is number four. Then last week we did a faith that anchors me in storms. Today we'll be looking at a faith that stays calm in a crisis. And as you can see, they're all uh, very much centered upon the book of James. But in today's particularly, we'll be looking at James, but also a lot about the um, Proverbs. There's a lot of Proverbs are going to come up today. And so if you want to look in your own uh, Bible, you're welcome to do so. And it'll be mostly in Proverbs. But we will start off with a scripture from James. And uh, I'm going to put it up on the screen. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to become angry, for man's anger does not bring about righteous life that God desires. Uh, would you excuse me a moment? I have an idea that nobody at home can hear me. I, have a, I didn't put it up properly. I think, and I'm going to do that again, sharing screen. My apologies to everyone at home. You. I can hear you. There we go. My apologies to everyone at home. You might have already closed the, 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 the recording off because of the fact that I didn't uh, have it uh, properly um, uh, sound uh, uh, put on for, for the whole service. And so we've got to uh, at the point where we've only really just uh, recapped about last week. So you haven't missed a whole lot, but uh, we do want to center upon this scripture on the screen right now, which is James chapter 1, 19 and 20. 
And the word that we want to take that's most important in that whole sentence is the word anger. And so when we talk about a faith that stays calm in a crisis, we're going to center upon that word anger today. And so that's really what we're going to be talking about and giving some, um, some solutions to the problem. Uh, the whole series was put together with these objects, and that is to, um, sorry, it's not moving. There we go. Uh, to live with calmness and competence and confidence during this pandemic. So that's the whole purpose of this series that, uh, that we are going through. So let's begin. Uh, it's not point number one. We're going to have six different points today. This is not one of them. This is simply an introduction, and that is that we're going to be looking at anger today and six biblical solutions to the problem of anger that comes about as a result of lockdown, as a result, as a result of the pandemic and all that sort of thing. But today we'll be looking at the six biblical principles of anger management. Anger seems to be a byproduct of this lockdown. There have been all sorts of reasons for it. For example, parents are frustrated through losing business or losing their jobs or reduced salaries. And this has caused anger in some people and uh, they're not happy about the situation. Some people have lost their businesses and things like that. Uh, the result of the anger problem, you've got financial problems uh, some people have health problems. Uh, many have got the, the virus and some have even died from it. So that's another reason for anger about the whole thing that we haven't got control of it. The anger about alcohol and cigarettes that are banned. Now that knows almost no bounds. I've heard people that are so upset about the fact that they can't buy their, their, ang their alcohol and they can't buy their cigarettes. When you're addicted to those things, I tell you, it's not easy to suddenly have someone say, you're not allowed to have it. And so I can understand the anger, but how do you deal with it? What about recreation and sports and hobbies and fellowship? We miss the fellowship in churches. That's one of the things that we miss. Uh, and uh, some people are angry about that. Uh, they don't have the, the wherewithal to get to church and they don't have... Uh, enough data on their or data on their computers to be able to actually watch it online and so many people are deprived of fellowship altogether children are frustrated because of all the restrictions why should a little child understand why he can't go and play with his friends you know it's not easy for little children so all of these things cause anger and difficulties in relationships uh, if marriages and families are not rooted in Christ, they come under tremendous strain at a time like this. And uh, it's worse for some people than others. Now, studies have shown that men are easily angered about things, okay? But ladies, on the other hand, are more, tend to be more angered about people. And so you see, you get a situation like, for instance, guys, you know that every time you do a job, you try and fix your car, uh, you try and fix a toilet. Whatever you do, you will find that there will never be a time where that job goes smoothly. There'll always be a problem in trying to get to the part that's broken. And in getting to the part that's broken, you will sometimes break something else. And now you've got two things you have to fix and you don't have the parts. So you've got to get out there to buy the parts. And very often you find you don't have the right tool for the job. And uh, I think you guys know what I'm talking about when you become frustrated and angry about the job that you're doing. And as a result of that, guys, we have to be careful that we don't take that anger at things and reflect it upon our family, you know, and, and we start to talk sharply to the family. But you see, ladies, you need to understand that if he talks sharply to you, he's actually not cross with you, he's cross with the thing that he's trying to fix. It's that darn toilet or that darn motor car. But I can't get fixed. So he's angry with that thing. He's not actually angry with you. But you see, these are some of the things that can come about in a time of lockdown, in a time when you're not allowed to live your normal life, and you become frustrated. So anger around the world has become a big thing. I mean, there's racial anger with a lot of people, and, they, and they're blowing it right out of proportion. Uh, but maybe it's justified. Who knows? 
You've got to understand that anger is something that's in the world today. Financial anger, health anger, alcohol bans, alcohol, cigarette bans, and all these things we've mentioned. You can understand that some people are very angry at this time. So what do we say as Christians? Where are the solutions to be found? You know, is the solution to unban alcohol? Is the solution to unban cigarettes? No, the solution for Christians is to know that the wisdom of how to live your life in a time of crisis calmly is the Bible, the Word of God, the wisdom of Scripture. And so I want to say this at this time. What you see in all of these, this whole series, it's not my wisdom that's coming out to you. It's not Rick Warren's wisdom, wisdom that's coming out to you. I want to tell you that it's not even James's wisdom, and it's not Solomon's wisdom. It's the wisdom of God, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, because all Scripture is given by inspiration from God, not from Solomon, not from James. They are simply putting down what the Holy Spirit told them to put down. And even they make mistakes. I don't know too much about James's mistakes, but I want to tell you, Solomon, well, can you imagine, guys, a thousand wives and concubines? You know, to sleep with everyone once only, it will take you three, nearly three years. Nearly a thousand of them. I mean, that's, that's not lust, that's stupidity. That's absolute stupidity. So when you talk about the wisest man that's ever lived, he makes some huge mistakes as well. So where does the wisdom come from is the key to anger management. It comes from God. It comes through the word of God to us because that's how God speaks to us. Sometimes he'll speak in other ways, prophecy and all the rest of it too. But mostly what God says to you is contained in the word of God. Hallelujah. Praise God for the word. Let's go to point number one. Realize the cost of uncontrolled anger. Now, in this particular point, I'm not going to say anything apart from Scripture. There's going to be a whole lot of Scriptures from Proverbs that will come up on your screen. If you want to look them up in your Bible, you can. Make a note of them if you want to. But that's what we're going to do with the realize the cost of uncontrolled anger. Only the Word of God. Consider then if these Scriptures apply to you. This one, Proverbs 29, 22. An angry man or woman stirs up dissension, and a hot-tempered one commits many sins. You see, that's the problem, that when we become angry, it stirs up dissension, and very often it causes us to sin, or some other people to become angry and sin. So it stirs up sin. In one of the translations, it puts it this way, same verse. A hot-tempered man gets into all kinds of trouble. That, I think, puts it into a nutshell. Commits many sins, gets into all kinds of trouble. Next scripture is Proverbs 15, verse 18. And that says, a hot-tempered man stirs up dissension, but a patient man calms a quarrel. A patient man calms a quarrel. It stirs up dissension when you are hot-tempered or causes arguments. That's what one of the translations says. Proverbs 14, 29 says, A patient man has great understanding, but a quick-tempered man displays folly or makes yeah. mistakes, is one of the Didn't translations. Pen and paper? It also says in the Good News Bible, if you had a hot temper, if you have a hot temper, you only show how stupid you are. <laughs> it says it quite uh, directly, doesn't it? And very clearly for us, that if you have a hot temper, you're only showing how stupid you are. Proverbs 14 verse 17 says, a quick-tempered man does foolish things, and a crafty man is hated. And then the last scripture for this point is Proverbs 11 29. The fool who provokes, provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left. So in other words, you provoke your family to anger, you end up with nothing, it's just the air. You know, it's, it's absolutely stupid. But let me say this before we go to the next point. So I think that every one of these scriptures and every one of these points applies to me as much as anybody else. 
I don't know. I'm still learning how to control anger. I don't know if anybody else is in that situation where things go wrong and the immediate reaction is anger. You see, it, it takes time. It takes God working in us for a long time before he gets us to be like Jesus. If anyone here is already like Jesus uh, and you are so Christ-like, that you hardly need to learn anything at all, I'll probably be doing your funeral tomorrow, which God will take you. You see, uh, none of us are perfect yet, otherwise we would be with Jesus. So we're learning, and I hope that all of these scriptures will not make you feel angry and, and offended because these scriptures come out in a sermon. They are in the Bible. And we need to learn from them. And if we're going to live the kind of life God wants us to live, then we need to realize the cost of uncontrolled anger. Point number one. Point number two, resolve to manage your anger. Now, what does resolve really mean? It means make a decision. You make a choice. Make a decision. You stop saying, I can't control my anger. Let me say this to you. People who say, I can't help what I am because that's how God made me. You know, I mean, that can apply to a whole lot of things other than anger. As you know, and I don't want to elaborate today in all the different things that people have in their lives that they say, you know, that's just the way I am. That is an insult to God. When you say, that's how God made me, you're insulting God. God did not make you into a person who loses your temper at the drop of a, of, of a hat. You know, quickly lose your temper, get angry with people, short-tempered. We do these things, but don't blame God. God didn't make you that way. You learned it somewhere. And you probably learned it from your parents or, you, or your friends or, or your teacher at school or whatever. There, it will come up again later, this point of, you know, you learned it from somewhere. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. In other words, we are now saying what God said. I'm giving you freedom of choice. That's what God made us to have. He didn't tell Adam and Eve that he would prevent them by putting a fence around the tree of life. Uh, and, the, and the tree of uh, good and evil, that they were not to partake of the fruit. God didn't put a fence around it that they couldn't get through. God gave them one fence only, freedom of choice. He said, don't do it. But they did it. But you see, that's how God acts with you and I. God says in the Bible, don't do this, and we go ahead and we do it. God's people, the Israelites, did it so often, and they reap, reap the, the consequences of it. But God doesn't stop us from doing it. People often ask the question, why is there so much evil in the world if God is such a good God? Because God gives people the freedom of choice. And so evil abounds because of the fact that we make wrong choices. But a man who is not a fool keeps himself under control. In other words, a wise man. That's what that scripture says. Israel often had to make choices, as I said earlier. So many times they were acting out of God's will. And uh, many times their leaders would get them together and say, now you better make a choice. Joshua was one of those leaders. He summoned all the tribes together. Now he had representatives from every tribe. And this is what he spoke to them about. First of all, he recited their history to them and how God had dealt with them in that time. In other words, he spoke of Abraham, all the way from Abraham, through the bondage in Egypt, from Abraham through the different tribes into the time when they went into bondage in Egypt. He went on to speak about the Exodus and the trials that they had in the Exodus. He went on and he spoke about how God had blessed them, how God had guided them, how God had provided for them in the wilderness. Their shoes didn't even wear out. They had food every day. God provided for them. He went through all these things with the people of all the tribes that Joshua was speaking to. Then he said this, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. 
And if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now that last verse is the part that <clears throat> the, the crux of the whole matter. In everything that Joshua said to them, in all the history and everything else he spoke about, the key point of all of it is when you get to that point where he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's how to resolve, to manage your anger. Make a choice. Joshua made that choice. He said to the people of Israel, you don't need to make the same choice, but this is my choice. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So that's what we want to focus upon. Um, point number three, we need to reflect before reacting. You see, in James, we read that scripture in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, when we started off this morning. And I want to read it again now. It says, my dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So what do we have there? James always speaks about what we should do and then gives you the consequences of that choice. You see, in this case now, he has made done exactly that. He's given you the consequences. What is the consequence? Anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. That's the result of not listening to God. Uh, the end result is anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. But in that verse of scripture now, we see three different points, action steps. Action step number one, be quick to listen. Listening calms people down. Every time you get into a situation where somebody becomes angry and they want to vent their anger, if you react in anger, now we have a, a real conflict. But if you just listen to the person, it tends to calm them down. And so listening is one of the action steps that we can all take. When you are tempted to be angry, listen to what the other person is saying. The second one is slow to speak. So in other words, James teaches us to tame your temper by taming your tongue. He speaks about that in chapter 3, which we will come to sometime in the future. So we're not going to elaborate on that today. But we do need to think about it. Be slow to speak. Don't be too quick. Quick to listen, slow to speak. You see, in Proverbs 29, 11, it says, a stupid man gives free rein to his anger, but a wise man waits for it and lets it grow cool. So cool the situation down. That's what we need to do. And that's what we need to learn from these scriptures. Uh, <clears throat> these, I think he's the second president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, said this, if you're angry, count to 10. And if you're really angry, count to 100. That helps you to calm down. A very really wise statement, isn't it? So in other words, what does he actually say? Delay the situation. Delay calms the, the situation. One of the things we need to, before we leave this point, is never discipline your children in anger. You know, if only I had been a Christian when we were bringing up our children. My natural reaction when a child does something that angers you is to discipline them immediately on the spot. And you almost think it's the right thing to do because after all, he's done the wrong thing or she's done the wrong thing and they know what they've done wrong. So now they must be disciplined. You see, what I learned in ACE, in the school system of ACE, that it is far better to let that child stew for a while. You see, if you are angry, send the child to their room, put the child in the corner, do whatever you need to do and go outside and get control of your anger. Go for a walk. Do something else until you have control of your anger and you can now go and give discipline 
that is in proportion to the, to the offense. So that's what I learned in ACE. I wish I'd known that when my children were small. And so for those that are still going to have children and you've still got children, remember that. Never discipline them while you're angry. Get control of yourself first and then you apply the discipline that is proportionate to the thing that they've done wrong. And discipline is important. Even God disciplines you. In fact, the Bible says if God doesn't discipline you, he hates you. He actually disciplines those he loves. So we need to discipline those people that we love, our children. The third point is be slow to become angry. Very important point. Proverbs 20, uh, 19 verse 11 says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Not easy to do. But you see, that is the scripture. That's what we should do as far as scripture is concerned. Three questions then that we should ask ourselves. The first one is why? Why am I angry? What has caused this? Why? Why am I hurt? Why am I frustrated? Why am I filled with fear which causes anger? You see, that's to know what caused it, why, is a very important question. What is just as important? What do I really want? You know, I've become angry about a situation that is because I want that situation to be different. So why am I angry and what do I actually want the outcome to be? You see, my actions will determine the outcome. So ask yourself a question. Why am I angry? What do I actually want to achieve through this anger? Because some anger is righteous. Okay, so what do I want to achieve? Why am I angry? What do I want to achieve? A quick reaction to any situation, or the third question, let's come to that first, is how can I get what I want? So then a quick reaction to an angry situation is never the solution. You see, ask yourself the questions, why, what, and how? Why am I angry? What actually do I want to achieve? How do I get what I want to achieve? So if we think of it in that way, we will not be guilty of reflecting before or overreacting before we reflect. So reflect simply means think about it first. Think clearly about the situation before you react. Point number four, release anger appropriately because anger will come. Is there such a thing as righteous anger? I just said that a minute ago. Well, yes. God is angry at sin every single day. Every day, God is angry at sin. That's what the Bible teaches me. And the wrath of God, the wrath of his righteous character, was poured out upon his son at Calvary for my sin. Boy, does that humble me to know that Jesus had all the wrath of God poured out upon him because of what I am and what I have done. It's my sin that caused Jesus to go to Calvary. Not only mine, yours as well. You see, that's the reality of it. That's why the breaking of bread is one of the ordinances. It's one of the things that Jesus said we need to do frequently. It's not something you can put out to do once a quarter, once a month, once a six months, whatever. You need to do this frequently because whenever you break the bread, whenever you drink the cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes. And that's how long we should keep on doing the breaking of bread until he comes. Jesus took my sins at Calvary. The full wrath of God's righteous anger was poured out upon Jesus at Calvary. So how then can we show anger against Satan's temptation? I've got three words. Now, of course, if I was a good, well-trained Baptist, I'd have three alliterated words, but I, I'm, I'm not that good. So I'm going to give you three words that don't rhyme. Three words that I know of. Here they are. Resist. Turn. And run. 
three things that you can do when Satan tempts you. Number one, resist him. The Bible says, resist him and he has to flee. So resist is number one. The second one is turn away from him. That's what repentance is all about. It's turning away. It's saying, I said in one of the sessions, think about something else. Every time you become angry, every time you get tempted to do something, think about something else. It's the best thing to do when Satan is tempting you in your thoughts. And you see, so often that's where temptation starts. It's in your thoughts. People who have problems with, be it alcohol, cigarettes, be it with gambling, be it with pornography or anything, it starts with your thoughts. And the more you think about it, the more you go and do that. Change your thoughts and think about something else. Turn from the temptation. And sometimes the temptation is so bad that you have to run. Run away. Not run towards it. Run away. The Bible says flee temptation. So those are my three words that uh, I think you should think about. Resist, turn, run. So then anger is not always the problem. The problem is actually how we release our anger. That's the real problem. You're not going to stop yourself from becoming angry. How do you release that anger? That's the crux of it. Ephesians says this, in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. You see, this is one of the things that you need to apply in a family more than anything else. Because a family is where anger and arguments can take place even in the afternoon or evening just before bedtime. And the Bible says, now don't go to bed. Stay up all night if you have to, but resolve that problem. Don't go down to sleep. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. We need to ask God to help us deal with anger calmly. You see, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1 is a very important one. In fact, if you forget all the other scriptures, remember this one of Proverbs 15 verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. If only I could learn that. Lord, help me to give a gentle answer. Because so many times when a person is angry, angry with you, the first reaction is an angry retort. It's such an important scripture that we all need to learn. A gentle answer turns away wrath. It helps the other person to get self-control when you answer in a gentle way. We all need to learn this. I need to learn it. And so I give that to you as a very important scripture. Uncontrolled anger breeds control, uncontrolled anger. That's what happens. When a person, when you react in an uncontrolled, angry way, that's what you can expect to come back at you. Aggression breed, breeds aggression. Uh, I don't know if you remember guys at school. Uh, I think most of you have probably had a fight somewhere at school. And, you know, it's because somebody says something that makes you angry and you retort in such a way that makes him angry and you end up getting into fisticuffs with each other. You know, thank goodness that usually the, the guys that you've had the first fight with becomes your best friend afterwards. Thank goodness for that. Aristotle, who lived for 62 years from 384 AD to 322 AD, uh, he said this, he described the necessity of keeping your cool, keeping your cool. He said, anyone can become angry. That's easy. But to be angry with the right person to the right degree at the right time and for the right purpose in the right way, that is not e easy. Wise words. You see, it's not easy to control anger and to release your anger in a godly way. There was a minister that I read about, uh, a true story of a minister who used to write tracts and writing articles for the newspaper, the local press. I don't know if you know such a person. Uh, uh, we had one who was a director of Emmanuel Press. He lives in Scotland. Uh, he's now very old and, uh, and he's actually spoken in our church, a lovely guy. And he writes to the newspaper frequently. 
the newspaper knows that when something comes from him, it's going to be something about the behavior of the people in their town. And, uh, and it's, it's not all critical. I mean, he's preaching the gospel. So it's good. It's good stuff. And this minister was one of those who often wrote to the press. And so they knew him very well. And he sometimes wrote tracts and had them published in the press. But he had an, an argument with another minister in the town who offended him. And he wrote a scathing report about this particular minister, and he was going to publish it in the newspaper. Now, he had decided to publish it in the newspaper, and he went to a third minister, not to ask him if you think I should publish this. He was going to publish it, but he wanted to know from this third minister, what title should I give to this article? So that's all he wanted to know, is what, what title should I give this article? So this minister very wisely thought about it before he answered, and he said, this is what I think you should call it. Go to the devil by the author of Come to Christ. The article was never published. And he went to that minister that had offended him and made right with him. And so out of that fight came two people who became close friends. You see, angry, anger with a person can actually have a good outcome at the end if you deal with it in a godly way. What wisdom that third minister had to not try to say, no, you can't publish this article. You know, it would have caused another argument. All he had to do is give that title, go to the devil by the author of Come to Christ. Number five, reprogram my mind. Wow, this is, difficult one. Making a different choice is not a one-off situation. I wish it was, but you only had to do that once in your life. But you know how many times you are going to have to choose to make a different choice. If I often lose my temper, where did I learn this behavior? I made reference to this earlier. Where did I learn it? Possibly from my parents. Possibly from an uncle or an aunt, somebody you respected, or a teacher, or a friend. You see, we, we, we influence other people, and uh, it's not always easy to control. If I learned it, though, I learned it from somewhere. Now, that means that I can unlearn it. If it's something that I wasn't born with, that I learned it from somewhere, then I'm able to unlearn it. You see, that reminds me so much of Edwin Louis Cole's ministry of saying Christ likeness and manhood are synonymous. He's trying to say that we are not as perfect as Jesus, but that's our objective. That's our goal. You see, if we can unlearn some of the bad habits and become more like Jesus, we become more Christ-like. We become more the kind of person God wants you to be. How do we do that? Romans 4 teaches us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That is your spiritual act of worship. And then he goes on to say, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. So re-pattern, reprogram your mind. Do not any longer be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's what Paul teaches us, wise words. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, God can give me a new pattern of thinking. He can help me to think differently about situations when I bring it to him. When I offer my body as a living sacrifice to God, then he goes to work through the Holy Spirit in changing my mind. When I'm willing to give God my actions, he begins to change my mind and my thinking. Praise God for the fact that that happened when we became Christians. Can you remember? When you first became a Christian, how automatically certain things 
disgusted you that you used to do before. You don't want to do them anymore. And, and that's reprogramming of the mind. And if we are tending towards anger too quickly, it's one of the things we need to bring to God and say, Lord, renew my mind. I need to be renewed, reprogrammed in this area of my thinking. And God will do it. It's called mental reconditioning. God can do that for you and I and change us, make us what God wants us to be. During this lockdown of COVID-19, there's been a lot of increase of anger and violence in the world. So then how does that affect you and I? I think one of the things we need to remember is every time you lose your temper, you are modeling that for somebody else. Your children learn from you. Your spouses, we learn from each other. Friends, neighbors even, we influence one another. Every time I lose my temper, I provoke somebody else to lose their temper. And so as a Christian, we need to model control, self-control. It's one of the things that God will help us to do. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Our children learn from us, our spouses, our colleagues, fellow Christians. So we need to be careful of relationships. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 24 says, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered. You see, because it helps you to become an easily angered person. Rather, keep your distance from such a person. That's what the Bible says. The wisdom of Proverbs, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit is given to uh, Solomon. There's far too much violence in the world. Uh, you know, Mercy and I sometimes have said this to each other. You, you, you're watching a film about a robbery, a gang that plans a robbery. And you know, they, they present it in such a way that at the end you actually hope they get away with it. And then you think to yourself, now who's watching this? Are some of the guys in prison with, with te televisions watching it? Or some of the guys that have just come out of prison and they're looking for a new method of how to conduct a robbery and we're teaching them on the television. You know how much violence we teach each other from the television? How many arguments are caused because you watch too much television? Arguments in families. There's far too much violence on television. I can remember the days when we grew, we had many, many years of our married lives with no television. You know, and, and it, didn't, it didn't do any damage to our children. It didn't do any damage to us not having television. In fact, we used to read books. I mean, when did you last read a book? Apart from the Bible, which you know you have to read every day. But you see, we, we don't read as much as we, as we used to. And there's too much violence and rubbish and immorality on television. Proverbs 11.29 says this, He who brings trouble on his family will only inherit the wind, and the fool will be the servant of the wise. We need to control what we allow into our family and into our homes. Colossians chapter 3 verse 19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. There's too much violence in families today, worldwide. All the countries are finding the same thing during this lockdown, that there's more violence of Husbands on wives, they're normal. It's increased. It's part of the lockdown. So then if you have family conflict, I want to give you a solution to it. Ask a farmer to help you. Why a farmer? Well, those that can speak Afrikaans, have you ever heard the expression, a boer mark a plum? What does it mean? Well, it simply means a farmer makes a plan. You see, if any of you have ever been a farmer, we, we ran a farm and, uh, and I had to be on that farm for seven, nearly eight years. And, and I was responsible to, for fixing 105 toilets. And I had to, to maintain the electricity of, of three houses and, uh, and 10 rooms that we let out, plus a garage and, and a cafe. 
And all of that maintenance was, was my problem. And uh, it was a lot of work. And many times I had to make a plan. Because if you if you hired an electrician to fix everything, like the, 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 the guy from Terry Urban came here and he condemned all our electrics. Now the guy we bought the farm from, with all these rooms and garage and, uh, and the houses and everything, we bought the farm as a going concern and his previous job was an electrician. So I thought, well, the electrics are okay. But when the guy came and inspected, he condemned the whole farm. Up not. I said, please, 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 give me time. We can't just fix it overnight. We don't have the money. Please give me time. And so eventually he gave me time, gave me a deadline. And I started to get one of the electricians. I nearly said his name, and I shouldn't say his name, because he was very expensive. Good electrician. But he used to come out to come together and he'd fix things. And every time he came, it was hundreds and sometimes even thousands. And then I realized, I, I can't do this. And so I rewired that whole farm. I knew nothing about electricity. Every time I went and bought some parts, I'd ask the guy behind the counter, how do I do it? What are the rules? What are the, the requirements? And that's how I rewired the whole farm. A boor mark a plan. You see, that's what happened. The farmer makes a plan. Now I want to tell you about a farmer. Uh, farmer math, they call it. You know, mathematics, farmer mathematics. You see this Missouri farmer died. And he left 17 mules to his three sons. But he told in his will exactly what the percentage was that each one of the sons had to get. And this is how it worked out. The oldest son had to get half. The second son had to get one third. And the youngest son had to get one ninth. Now these guys were not very highly educated, but they knew enough mathematics to know that you can't divide 17 by two. It's eight and a half. You can't have half a meal. And you can't divide 17 by three. It also doesn't go. And you can't divide 17 by nine, because two nines are 18 and one nine is nine. So you know, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna cut the meals in half? Or, well, that sort of thing. And so the result of this was anger. They got into arguments with each other and they became so angry that the anger became known to one of their uncles who lived on a farm not very far away. So this uncle decided that he was going to come and help these guys to sort out the problem. And so he hitched up his own mule and went to see these three guys to help them sort out the problem. So this is how this farmer made a plan. He took his mule and added to their 17. That made it 18. Okay, so now you can divide 18 by two and the first guy got nine. You can divide 18 by three and the second son got six. And you can divide 18 by two, by nine. So the third guy got two. They each got the percentage that their, their father had told them to get. That's wonderful. But if you add that up, it comes to 17. So the farmer took his mule and went home. The brood mark alone. There will always be a solution. Point number five. It's the last one. And we'll close with this. I'll ask God to fill me with his love. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 and 5 says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. That's our subject for today. It keeps no record of wrongs. And so we need to have the fruit of the Spirit. Because as we live for God, the fruit that he puts into us through the Holy Spirit is a fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So to me then, the fruit of the Spirit refers to character, to essence. You see, I made reference earlier to Edwin Louis Cole, and, and I think the same thing about Solomon, and the same, same thing about James. You see, many times we think that they are just talking about 
how we live our lives. But is it only that? You see, the fruit of the Spirit is the exact description of God's own Spirit. That's what God is. Love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's God. That's Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. The only one who ever lived that perfect life on earth is Jesus. Colossians 1.19 says that God was pleased to have all his fullness living in Jesus. That is, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all of them lived in Jesus because all the fullness of God lived in Jesus. In another verse it says, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So Jesus had everything that God is, his character. And as we submit daily to the Holy Spirit, the fruit grows in us. And the question is, are we rooted in Christ? Are we connected to the vine? See, Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. <clears throat> you have to be connected to me or else you can't live the kind of life the Father wants you to live. Are we connected to the vine? I said that James <clears throat> can be mistaken as a book of behavior. You know, I said it earlier that Edwin Lee Cole, James, uh, uh, Solomon, uh, we, we can so often look at their, 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 the things they've written and think that it's all about behavior. It's all about how you, what you do and all about your works and, and how you react to situations and all that. But you know, in actual fact, I don't believe that's true at all. It's actually all about character. It's about who you are and what you are. Not so much about what you do. Um, so James tells you new one. about how to do things and how to control your time. Oh, those are the two certain things and how to all the works. He said, "Tell me you've got faith. And show me your faith by, your, by, by, by by what you do, and I'll show you my faith by my works." So it's works, works, works. But in actual fact, it all boils down to character, not works. You can't make yourself into a good Christian. You can allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Invite the Holy Spirit. In chapter 3, it speaks about taming the tongue. Now, taming the tongue, we'll come to it in another time. But let me just bring this out now. You need to connect those scriptures about the tongue. James says that the tongue, is, it's, it's like the rudder of a ship. It's a small rudder, and it can steer a big ship where you want it to go. It, it's like a, a, a spark in a, in a forest. It can set a whole forest on fire. That's the tongue. But put that together with Jesus' teaching about the tongue. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So Jesus said, get it in the right perspective, you see. James is quite right about the tongue. But get it in the right perspective, because the tongue is only saying what's in the heart. That's where the problem is. It's not a tongue problem. It's a heart issue. David said, create in me a pure heart, O God. So one of the most important ways to deal with anger is to ask God to fill us with his love. If we have God's love, what will you love most? Have you thought about that? If you have God's love, what will you love most? People. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We would love our neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Read what Jesus says about who's your neighbor. Good Samaritan. Everybody. We love people. We will want people to be saved. How much do you want people to be saved? I want to close with this story. It's about a, a missionary <clears throat> by the name of Abraham Benninger. 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 I'm not sure how he pronounced it. He was actually on a ship, uh, a Swiss boy on a ship going from Europe to America in the early days. He was actually on the same ship as, as um, uh, John Wesley, when John Wesley went over. Now, I don't know if John Wesley directly influenced this boy, 
but I think he did. But what happened on the ship is both of his parents died. Now he's a young man, he lives in America, and he doesn't know what to do. And he decides he loves the Lord, and he felt uh, after prayer that God wanted him to go to one of the Caribbean islands, to an island called St. Thomas, and to preach the word of God to the slaves. He couldn't do anything about abolishing slavery, he's just a young man. But he knew that these slaves needed the gospel. And he wanted to go there and preach the gospel to these guys. So he went to St. Thomas and he found when he got there that it was illegal for anybody to preach the word of God to the slaves, except another slave. So the slaves could preach to each other, but nobody else could preach to them. And so he wrote a letter to the governor asking if he could become a slave. That's how much he wanted to preach the gospel to them. This governor was so impressed with his letter that he actually sent it to the king of Denmark because it fell, it fell under Denmark at that time. And the king of Denmark was so touched by this letter that he wrote back and said he doesn't have to become a slave by giving permission to preach to the slaves. And so he preached the word of God to the slaves. And so the crux of that story is that his love for those lost slaves was more important to him than his freedom. Boy, does that challenge me about doing what God has given you to do. Now, you see, none of you may ever hear from God that you have to leave South Africa and go and become a missionary in China or anywhere else in the world for that matter. But I want to tell you something in closing today, that you are a missionary in Elspeth because God has placed you in Elspeth and your purpose in Elspeth is not to live a good life. Your purpose is to show Jesus to other people. Is it so important that we would be prepared to become a slave in order to preach to the people that God connects to? French. That's how important it really is. And so let's close in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we confess to you that we are often angry beyond just or justice. Angry beyond what we should be. But we need your help. Help us, O oh Lord, to give a calm, sweet answer, a calm answer, a soft answer, when people speak to us harshly. Help us, O oh God, to control our anger, even if we sometimes have to go and get alone for a while until we are in control of it before we speak. Not to speak too quickly, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, as the scripture teaches us to be. And so we ask those things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you like to stand and close in the singing of this chorus? to
Father, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Make sure you can see it. It's me off. I think you switch yourself off. It's still there. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Hello, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Steve. Bless you. Take care. Hello. Hello, Wanty Joyce. <laughs> Hi. Hope you're doing well. Hey, under the circumstances, we are trying. Okay. Have you got it recorded or not? How are you, my brother? Hi, Tawis. Bye bye. Thank you. God bless. Bye. Goodbye. Oh, <laughs> oh, What's happening? What is happening here? I've done something wrong. And I don't know if I've got the recording done today at all. And I can't see. <laughs> it won't let me get into it. <laughs> 